in this last session of the Core Reduce in Transition Week, uh, virtual week, sorry, uh, we will first provide you uh, with an update of the work that the Secretariat has been uh, carried out uh, and is actually still carrying out uh, in the past months, uh, including uh, the publication of, of four toolkits uh, that have been presented also uh, in three webinars. Uh, and I, uh, I hope many of you had the, the opportunity to um, uh, to take part in those webinars, but anyway, all these materials is available through the web pages of the uh, of the Secretariat, uh, through the um, Europa website and uh, and, uh, and the, on DG Energy. Uh, moreover, uh, despite the obvious uh, uh, traveling limitation, uh, the start uh, technical assistance work uh, is is also ongoing, and uh, we have been we had uh, uh, quite some uh, some progress uh, in, in that regard. Um, the colleagues uh, of the Secretariat, Paul Baker and uh, Maria Yetano Roche, uh, will give you uh, a more detailed update of the work of the Secretariat in, in the first part uh, of today's session. Um, we also uh, reached out to you uh, recently, uh, especially to the regional authorities, uh, through a survey um, to have a first overview of uh, how the COVID-19 uh, has affected uh, your regions, the core regions in transition. Uh, you might have read the results of this uh, uh, of this work in our latest newsletter item. Um, and building on this on this uh, on this result on this exchange with you, uh, the second part of today's session uh, will take the form uh, of a round table, uh, focusing on perspective and insights of regional transitions in these times of uncertainty. And the round table will, will bring together members of the Secretariat, um, Robert Pollock and uh, Timon Bennett, uh, with senior representatives of Coal uh, and Pete uh, regions uh, in, in transition. Um, so without, uh, without further ado, uh, I think we can start with the, with the first part uh, of the meeting that will focus uh, uh, on, on the Secretariat activities. Uh, and I'm pleased uh, to leave the floor to uh, Maria Yetano Roche. Maria, can you, are you yes. able to? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Carlo. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Maria Yetano. I am a researcher at Wuppertal Institute. We are members of the Secretariat. I hope my camera is working. Um, and so I'm going to give an overview of one of the mm, sides of the work in the Secretariat of the Platform, um, which is the provision of support materials. And I just want to give you a little taste of what has been done and what is available right now, and a little bit about what is coming up. Um, just to explain what do we mean by support materials for coal regions in transition, um, we are... Um, very aware that uh, there is a lot of knowledge needs and, and, um, and, and, and a lot of um, demand for exchange of knowledge. And so one of the roles that the Secretariat envisaged was um, a broker of this knowledge and also uh, bringing a focus on knowledge resources that are scattered and fragmented, but can be, when brought together, very useful to, to inspire and to enable um, practitioners in the coal regions in transition to initiate or, or, or improve on their activities. So we are um, very aware that knowledge is uh, place-based and what has worked in one place might not work in another. This is what we know and have discussed already over this week. And, and there is a, a very context-specific uh, element to uh, regional transition. On the other hand, there's a, a wealth of knowledge that we bring together um, and can inspire and enable different uh, actors um, um, and, 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 and improve the, the, the experiences in the transition. And um, just to clarify, also in terms of audiences, we have a, in, in the support material provision, we have a broader target audience than the target, for example, of the technical assistance that um, will be described later by Paul. Um, so we have all 
EU coal regions in transition in mind as a tar target and all sorts of stakeholders uh, from government to uh, social partners to civil society. And we've tried to cater for, for all of these. So it's a rather complex uh, task. Uh, so if I can ask for the next slide. So just this is a key takeaway. The materials that are available for now are 12 case studies or good practice studies and four toolkits. And they can be found on that link. I ask you to take note and go and consult it because there you can find those materials and other general uh, non-platform materials that are linked there. Um, so um, for, um, next slide, please. So where it concerns the case studies, um, which um, uh, we have developed over the last year, we have a, a now a wealth of them. We have a whole 12 of them. The last two are just undergoing proofreading and they will be published very soon. But as you will see from this long list, Without going into the details, we cover from um, regional development agency cases to stakeholder engagement cases to online platforms for information, uh, different governance aspects, different uh, cultural heritage um, um, initiatives, and um, and we try to also have a we try to also have a representative geographical coverage, including outside the EU, uh, taking some examples from Canada, from the US, and from Australia. And those are hopefully organized in a way that they, where we bring the key messages out and you get the, what's really, really interesting about that study. So I would encourage you to, to look at it and see um, whether they, they, they take, um, whether the, the key takeaways are, are of use in, uh, for, for your practice. Um, next slide, yes, thank you. As to the toolkit, this has been the bulk of our effort in the last month, and I believe many in the audience today may have listened already to the webinars where we uh, presented them. They are also available on that link, and there are four. Uh, they deal with uh, um, four different topics, but two of them are very related. They are the ones on transition strategies, and governance of transitions. These are guidance documents that bring that collect um, existing examples, existing tools, and that put them in the context of the coal region's challenges to provide um, some support uh, in terms of design of strategies, design of stakeholder engagement processes. And I want to highlight how they are very closely related and have been, it has been highlighted over the last week that these two, the strategy design and implementation and the governance model for coal regions in transition are closely linked and crucial for what is coming up in terms of territorial just transition plans. Um, I don't see the slides anymore. Okay, webinars. Yes, <laughs> we have presented the four toolkits on webinars. We've had also regional practitioners coming in to, to give their points of view uh, for spe specific regions. And all of those are available on, online and you can listen to them. I want to mention in this sense that um, in terms of future plans for toolkits, um, there are two more coming up and they will be uh, focusing, one of them will be focusing on finance uh, and funding sources. Uh, and I hope that will be, um, the, the exact scope will be decided over the next um, months. Uh, now that the just transition mechanism is, uh, the, once the rules are all approved and we can move on to um, supporting regions in, in accessing finance and guidance on accessing finance. So with that, I want to say, uh, that um, there are mm, in, at the moment no more further plans for webinars, but we would really like to hear, and I think there's a survey coming at, at the end on, on what kind of knowledge uh, products and, and knowledge exchange initiatives we could further implement. So thank you very much.
Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Paul Baker uh, from the uh, Secretariat, um, Special Advisor to the Secretariat. And I would just like to uh, give you uh, a short update on the technical assistance uh, activities that have been carried out over the last uh, few months. Um, so if we could just move to the next slide. So uh, just as by way of background, for those of you who are not familiar, we launched a request for technical assistance in June of last year, and we notified um, in October the seven regions that were successful. Um, and you can see uh, from the map here uh, the regions that we are covering, um, in, uh, indicated in blue. Um, and quite a diverse set of regions. So we have from the Midlands in Ireland, which is obviously a, a, a peat region, down to uh, Megalopolis in the, in the Peloponnese, and uh, from Silesia and Malopolska in Poland across to uh, Astorius in Spain. And these are covering regions that are both deep coal mining, lignite mining, and as I've mentioned, peat but also very different in terms of characteristics of the regions that we're, we're dealing with in terms of quite industrialized regions down to, to very rural uh, regions. Um, so over the coming months, going through to, to uh, through next year, we will be working with these regions uh, on a number of topics, uh, strategy development, strategy and transition planning, project identification selection, project development, governance issues, and also supporting them in consultation and stakeholder engagement uh, activities. So if we could just move to the next slide. So as I mentioned, seven, seven regions are being supported. Um, the support that we deliver um, varies, but uh, more or less it's, it's, it's around 100 days per, per region. Um, and the idea is that this support should be complementary to other uh, EC uh, support activities to these regions, and also uh, at the national level, if there's support being delivered at the national level. And we're very keen to, to work very closely with uh, regional and local administrations and other actors at a local level and to closely uh, coordinate our activities with them and consult with them. And the idea being that this should be a, a co-creation process. The idea is that it is technical assistance and it's not about simply delivering reports, but uh, also um, working with, with, with the relevant people to, to, to take forward their transition actions. Um, so far, um, we have undertaken five regional field, field visits. Uh, they were undertaken in the last quarter of last year and the beginning of this year, prior to activities obviously being temporarily suspended uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation. Um, we still have two regions uh, where we need to, to still make the site visits, one of those being Silesia and, and the other being the Chu Valley um, in Romania. Uh, although in both of those cases there are other EU supported activities going on. So what we have done with the with the regions, we, we initially went on the site visit and in that period we've, we've met both with administrations but also with a whole range of, uh, of local actors, whether they are from, from industry, whether they are from community and NGO groups, um, and both at sort of uh, the regional level but also at the level of municipal uh, authorities as well, uh, also trade unions and, and a, a variety of, uh, of actors, uh, workers, uh, to try to get a good feeling of what's been going on. On the basis of uh, those uh, visits, uh, we have developed work plans for the five regions that, that we have uh, visited. Um, and we are now in the process of trying to deliver support. Uh, obviously adapted to, to the present the present circumstances. So whereas we had hoped that we would be 
heavily engaged in, in, in on-site uh, visits and, and working closely. We, we're obviously having to do that a little bit more um, at distance. And at the same time as, as doing that, we're also trying to main clo maintain close cooperation with uh, the European Commission services. We're in very close contact, obviously, with DG Enna, but also with DG Regio and DG Reform to make sure that our activities are aligned with and complement complementary to, to other activities that are going on, and also to make sure that we're engaging also with uh, regional and particularly national level uh, departments and ministries to, again, in order to ensure that uh, you know, our activities are, are complementary to, to, to other activities that are going on, um, and to see how we can fit uh, within that also in terms of uh, being aware of what developments are going on at the national level. Um, also in terms of funding uh, um, and other transition-related uh, activities that are ongoing. Um, currently, I think it's fair to say that we are probably most advanced in terms of our technical support, in terms of the, the actions that we are doing in the Midlands in Ireland. Um, it was a priority region for us uh, because of the, 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 the speed at which the transition away from peat was taking place in Ireland. Um, and in that case, we have been also coordinating our activities with the activities of the Irish government and the launch of the Irish government's own Just Transition Fund. And so we have been working with the Midlands region in order to help them and support them to identify um, projects um, and then also to, to align that with the uh, funding that will be available from the Irish Just Transition Fund, and also for those um, projects that are not going to be supported through the Irish Fund, but also to look at what other opportunities there may be for, for funding of local projects. So we've been doing that. We've also been, I think, engaged quite heavily with Astorius. Um, uh, and obviously, in, in that case, um, they have uh, been revising their own scenarios for, for energy transition as a result of the the COVID-19 situation, um, and so that's also something that we're, we're we're seeing how we can we can adapt our support in order that it fits with the developments that are going on at the regional level. If I can just move on to the next slide. So, um, alongside trying to work at the uh, uh, with our with our uh, partners in the in, in the regions. Um, we've also been developing materials uh, as part of the, uh, the START support. And I would just like to mention these because I think they may be of interest uh, to, a, to a wider audience. In particular, we are working with uh, each of the START regions to develop a, a regional profile. Um, and that regional profile is to outline, provide an outline of the situation of the coal sector, or in the case of the Midlands, the, the, the peat sector but also to look at what they're doing in terms of their transition planning and also the challenges and opportunities that they, they face in terms of transition. And the idea is that it gives us a, a kind of baseline evaluation of the current situation, although obviously in some cases uh, we started working on these pre-COVID-19, so it's a obviously rapidly developing situation. And I think that this is something that may be interest to, to other regions, and we would also be interested perhaps in the future if other regions are interested in this, in, in looking at the possibility of providing regional profiles also for regions that are not covered under the START initiative. The other um, document that you can find available, and these are all available on the web pages, if you look on the, uh, the web page of the, of the now initiative, what was formerly the platform, uh, under the technical assistance. We are a number of documents that relate to the Midlands engagement process. Um, this is a document that provided guidance to uh, people who are interested in submitting projects and programs to uh, the, the Midlands region. And the idea is that that would be to develop a, an inventory of, of, of projects for the region. Um, it's also to align it with, as I mentioned, the Irish Just Transition uh, Fund efforts that are going on at the national level. Um, but in addition, we've also looked at um, 
providing some information on what are the um, emerging economic activities in in this case in rural communities because the Midlands is a very rural area and also providing examples of you know innovative and, and community-led uh, rural development projects um, which could help maybe to inspire some ideas about the sorts of projects that could be relevant in the in the context of a, a fairly rural um, region that is um, uh, undergoing a transition away from uh, carbon-based uh, um, in this case extraction and power generation finally I would just like to wrap up already been mentioned by Carlo um, but we undertook the regional survey um, and that was uh, sent out to, to all members of the, the administrations that were members of the of the platform but of which all of fortunately all of the start regions also responded and that was to look at the impact of the COVID-19 um, uh, on impact on, on at a regional level, and that I suppose provides me, and I see that my 10 minutes are now up, but it provides the the perfect link to uh, Robert, who is now going to host the uh, discussion, the panel discussion, uh, which is looking exactly at this at this issue and providing new perspectives. So I'd like to hand over to Robert now. Thank you, Paul. Um, welcome to the session on regional transition in a time of uncertainty, perspectives and insights. Uh, this morning's roundtable discussion is driven and directed by your questions, and we have an excellent panel to answer and consider your questions. These are undoubtedly uncertain times for our regions. The effects of COVID-19 are still unfolding, that these effects are social and economic. As Paul alluded to, the survey, our survey has surely indicated that the pandemic has had a profound impact on coal and peat regions and oil shale regions. Also, we know during this period that we can't return to business as usual that we need to adopt new approaches. And change always brings uncertainty. It's, it's a common neighbor of change, that is uncertainty. But this week we have heard what such change could look like. We, over the last few days, have heard that there is a need, an urgency to invest in and support a green recovery. We've heard that there is even more need for systems thinking and policy making, linking the economic, the social, the environmental drivers of change. And one of the recurring messages from this week is there is a pressing need for joined up policy making, policy making across departments of government and ministries of government, but also joined up policy making between the local level, the regional level, the national level and the European level. And we're also aware from today's discuss this week's discussions that social dialogue is more important than ever. We need to think about multi-actor partnership working. That is genuine partnership working between the public sector, the private sector, and civil society. So yes, we need to change, and change brings uncertainty. However, against this backdrop of uncertainty, we have also seen some very positive signs this week. I was quite struck yesterday by a poll, a survey that was undertaken in yesterday morning session, where 40% of the delegates felt optimistic or hopeful about the future in terms of decarbonisation. And I think that is quite a, a meaningful figure, that even in a time of crisis, as we find ourselves, that 40% of the delegates were positive about the future. Plus this week, I think we have seen greater clarity in the direction of travel of EU policy and EU funding. And I think we, the coal regions, uh, can take encouragement from the fact that we have seen the Just Transition Fund increase from 7.5 billion euros to 40 billion euros. Obviously this 
figure it has to be finalised, but it is a clear commitment of direction of travel for decarbonisation in coal, peat and oil shale regions. So I'm delighted that this morning we have a panel of distinguished and learned colleagues to answer your questions this morning. The panel is composed of three start regions, representatives of three start regions, and as Paul alluded to in his earlier presentation, START stands for Secretariat Technical Assistance for Regions and Transitions. And three of the panelists are receiving START support. Asturias, Midlands, and Carlo Bavari in the Czech Republic. All three regions are very different. One is a hard coal region, one is a peat region, and another is a lignite region. But all are affected by transition and the challenges that we find ourselves in at the moment. So the panel is made up of, firstly, Maria Bellarmina Diaz Aguado. And Maria is the Director General for Energy, Mining and Reactivating in the Principality of Asturias and Spain. In that role, Maria has an instrumental purpose or focus on achieving transition within the region. So I think her, her, her contributions will be very valuable. Also, Maria has had a long career and distinguished career, not only in government in Asturias, but also she has very good and strong links with the mining community within the region. Our second panelist is Kieran Mulvey. Uh, Kieran was appointed by the Irish government as the nation's just transition commissioner last year. And again, he has a very instrumental role in ensuring the process of transition is successfully pursued in Ireland, but more specifically in the Midlands region of Ireland, where the peat industry is concentrated. Kieran has had a, a long and distinguished career in labour relations in Ireland and has, had a significant, has made a significant contribution to public life in Ireland and is currently the chairman of Sport Ireland. Yiri Sterba, our third panellist, uh, works in Carlo Bavari. He uh, works with the regional governor uh, and he coordinates the Restart programme, the, the Czech government uh, transition uh, programme for coal regions, and also works very closely with us on the START programme. Again, Yuri is somebody who may be in government but has had a significant experience, both practical and research experience, of the mining industry. Our final panellist is Timon Benert. Uh, I'm sure many of you know Timon, uh, who have been involved in previous working group meetings. Uh, Timon is one of the senior advisors to the Secretariat of the of Coal Regions and Transition Initiative, and he is a senior member of the team at the Wuppertal Institute. And along with Maria Yutano, who you've just heard from, uh, Timon was instrumental and highly influential in the development of the recent toolkits and case studies and the webinars. I'm going to hand over to each panelist and they can give a three to four minutes of their own personal reflection on this, this period of transition within their respective regions, this time of uncertainty. But that really is just setting the scene for the question and answer session. And please do, uh, Submit your questions. I'm sure you're familiar with how you do that. Uh, you have your question panel, so please use that. And ideally, please address your questions to all the panelists. And as Carlo mentioned at the start, if we cannot answer questions because of time, we will hopefully be able to get back to you in the coming days and weeks. And I think given that the emphasis is very much on Q&A and discussion. I think I'll leave it there and I'll hand over to Maria for her first contribution. You have the floor, Maria. Thank you very much, Robert, for your, for your words and thank you for the support of the platform through the START initiative. Because at this moment, next please, the scenario that Asturias as a region, in, next please, next slide, the scenario that Asturias is, fa yeah, is facing during this transition is a very um, special scenario. 
We were seeing before the, the regional minister who wants to say some words. Would it be possible to listen to him, Roberto? Thank you very much. Asturias is one of the European regions affected by this transition from a coal and carbon based economy to a more sustainable ecosystem, facing all the uncertainties of abrupt change. Thus, the support of the coal regions in transition platform through the Secretariat and the START initiative is being necessary. Regional governments need And this is really important because I was saying when we, we compare our scenario by 2030 with what happened in 2017, we know that there is going to be a decrease in power capacity of over 25% of energy generation above a 55% and of CO2 emissions of 96%. And that in a region with closure of coal mines and a very industrial region with high intensive consumption in energy. So this is, uh, of course, this is uncertainty. I would say we even face certain risks with some kind of vertigo. When we see pictures like the one on the right, which corresponds to two days ago, the workers of one of the coal plants, which is about to close, belonging to Iberdrola, want solutions for the area. And we see that there is no commitment from the company to uh, give, bring in some solutions for these territories. So we know who we are. We know we are uh, mountaineers. We know we are farmers. We know we are above all miners and we are coal people. We know what we aim, what we want. We want a just transition from coal economy and from a coal economy based on coal mainly to a, a diversification. We know why, because we want sustainability and we don't want, we know that we don't inherit the earth from ancestors. What we want to do is to uh, give we borrow it from our children and we're going to give a more sustainable world to them. And we know, or we thought we knew when. We thought it was by 2030, the phase out of coal. But with the COVID situation, we know it's going to be faster and faster. And uh, things are happening even before we thought. So the, the question we would propose to the START initiative is how? How do we do this? Um, how, how much support are we going to get from the European Union? How, uh, how are we getting this support? and how much support do we need? Because we are going through economic diversification and transformation, we are going through a technological disruption, and we are going to, uh, towards sustainability. And if we don't do this in a proper way, we will have explosion we see on the right picture, and that is very, very worrying. So next, please. During this work with the platform, we know the perspectives of Asturias have to focus in identifying opportunities from our roots from what we are, from the natural resources, sea, wind, miners, experienced as miners. And we want to focus on the social dialogue, as Robert was saying. We think it's very important this public and private partnership and to improve cooperation and policy between all the administrations. And we want to focus on a pipeline of projects, knowing that there is no magic solution for anything, but we have to give our territories their own tools for this diversification we are looking for, we are aiming. So finally, um, I would like to say that, next please, next slide. I would like to say that all these uh, focuses on uh, making a transition in Asturias that is replicable and transferable to other regions in Europe, we think that those who go ahead need to be an example for others, and this model can be replied, turning risks into opportunities. And we don't want to feel alone. We don't want to walk alone in this transition. And we need the support from the EUA, EUE. When the launch of the coal platform took, care, took place, I was very concerned of making the voice of Asturias being heard in Europe. I wanted Europe to listen to Asturias. Now, during the launch of this uh, Just Transition platform, I want to remind the voice of the coal regions, the regions in transition, because we are facing a historical opportunity with many, many uh, possibilities and opportunities, but also with a huge responsibility. And that's uh, what our role should be for this uh, transition. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, Maria, for that very insightful presentation. And I love that term, you'll never walk alone. And I think that is something which the platform 
the initiative has demonstrated over the last two years that regions should not be walking alone in this journey of transition. It is a collective endeavour that we must face together. I would now like to hand over to Kieran. And as I mentioned, Kieran is the Just Transition Commissioner for Ireland, who has been doing a lot of work in the Midlands, the peak region of Ireland. So you have the floor, Kieran, please. Thank you very much, Robert, and uh, thank you uh, for the participants for agreeing to watch and listen to this uh, webinar on Just Transition. Uh, I'd like to thank Robert and his colleagues for all the assistance they've given us to date. I didn't know the Asturias were Liverpool supporters. As you know, their team song is You'll Never Walk Alone, and they're premier champions in England just now. Anyway, moving on. Uh, I was appointed just transition commissioner by the Irish government last November in the light of a crisis that had developed due to the overturning of various planning laws in Ireland that had allowed the utilisation of peat harvesting uh, for uh, energy generation, resulting in the closure of two power plants. And effectively now in the light of new decisions by our Supreme Court last week to close down peat harvesting in Ireland. So what we expected to move from a situation in 2017 of closure, or sorry, 2027 of closure, we're now facing the closure in 2020. So a rapidity of change, uh, similar to what uh, Maria has just described in regard to the Asturias region. Next slide. These were my terms of reference. They'll be available for you to read, but effectively, uh, in summary, I was asked by the government to come up with a new plan for the Midlands region, having engaged extensively with all the stakeholders in the region, local authorities, social partners, trade unions, uh, state agencies, uh, politicians, uh, the community, etc. So I issued uh, next slide then. I'm aware of a very short period of time. There's the Midlands in Ireland. It'll now I've extended the region to cover other three new counties that have been impacted by the peat harvesting uh, decision. Uh, so in effect, uh, a considerable volume of the Midlands region in Ireland uh, will now be come under just transition funding designation. I presented my initial report to the government in June of this year. Move on, please. And uh, I have indicated in that report uh, a number of areas, challenges, observations, recommendations, and implementation plans. But effectively, what I am saying is that there should be a whole of Midlands approach in the region. County should not be competing with county, state agency with state agency. We should co cooperate together in a new strategic plan, which I've identified. Uh, play to the strengths of the region. What is it good at doing outside of peat harvesting? And it has particular areas of uh, light engineering. It has renewable energies. It has food. It has biodiversity. It has heritage and tourism. All of these should be concentrated uh, in new green energy proposals and green enterprise. I also make the recommendations on uh, new just transition funds beyond uh, the current period into 2021-23, and I'm recommending a further expenditure there of 25 million euro by the Irish government. The Irish government have responded positively to the report and have indicated agreement with most of the recommendations I make. Some have been reserved to budget decisions for 2021, which will take place in October. They are largely around carbon fund and carbon tax expenditures. But I have stated the case uh, for the Midlands in terms of the continuation of green energy funding, green agriculture funding, green enterprise funding. And I and the START team and our team in the Midlands with our central government department for climate change are now engaged in the dispersal of the existing 11 million uh, in projects in the region. To bring you up to date, uh, we've had a new government formed in Ireland last week, made up of our two historical civil war parties who historically have merged to have agreed to form a government with the Greens in Ireland, who were very successful in the last election and have now three Green ministers in government uh, in the cabinet, one of whom will be in charge, the leader of the Greens, Eamon Ryan, of climate change. There is a whole new program for government with a very, very strong and clear emphasis 
on addressing climate change in Ireland, the issues around ch climate change, and they are now recommending support for the just transition in the Midlands and my recommendations, but also to go further than that and create a new office, statutory office, independent office of um, just transition commissioner, which will have its own resources in the future. A new climate change bill is to be introduced in the Irish Parliament within the next 100 days, and that will outline a considerable number of measures across our economy, social services, etc. <coughs> Excuse me for just transition investment. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran. Um And I like the reference to Liverpool Football Club. <coughs> I must say, my own city football club, Celtic Football Club, have also borrowed the song "You'll Never Walk Alone." So it resonates across Europe. Um, I would like to just remind um, the the delegates that please do start uh, asking questions for the panel. As I said, it would be good if these questions were addressed to all the panelists, uh, but it would be good to get questions from the floor so that the panelists can provide their insights and views. Um, our next panelist is Yuri Sterba. Uh, as I mentioned, Yuri is from the Karlovavari region in the Czech Republic, a lignite uh, region of Europe. And uh, he is coordinating the, the Czech national response in, in the region and also the start technical assistance uh, support. So, Yuri, please, you, you have the floor. I'm not sure if we have a connection with Yuri. Um, it may it may have been temperamental, and we I think we have perhaps lost Yuri. So could I suggest that we now move on to Timon Timon Benhart? And as I said earlier, Timon is a member of the Secretariat and has been instrumental in the development of the Secretariat and the initiative, and works for the renowned Wuppertal Institute, and is based in Berlin. Timon, I hope you are connected. Over to you. Yes, uh, I am. Uh, sad not to hear from uh, Yuri from uh, uh, Kalavari, but um, I just maybe some some thoughts I, I bring into the discussion. I mean, um, you, Robert said it's it's this time of uncertainty, and I think this issue of uncertainty is is really grappling with all of us. And and you mentioned the the survey we've done and the discussion we've had we've had with the regions, but now. Uh, both Maria's and, and Kieran's presentation and other things we've heard through the week, it, it's my impression that in this uncertainty, there seems to be a tendency of actually it's happening faster than we expected or that most people thought it's, it's, uh, it was planned two years ago, five years ago. Um, me as a scientist, if I look uh, at scenarios, um, they're increasingly becoming uh, more ambitious and and a quicker phase out of fossil fuels in general, not only coal. And I think if if we think of what kind of certainty is there in these times of uncertainty, to me one is it's this phase out of coal is happening and it's probably happening quicker. And we need to think of how to respond to that. And and when I look back at uh, what I've listened to into this week, I found it interesting that uh, in, in the uh, speech that Mr. Timmermans gave at the beginning of the week, he said something, it, it's not a proper quote, but he said something like, we need to be careful when what we build in response to the COVID crisis is really something that holds on for a long period of time, uh, that we're really moving forward, not backward, and that we don't build up something which we need to dismantle uh, 10 years from now. And, and I found it interesting, um, I listened also into the Wednesday afternoon session, there were several interesting inputs from Italy, uh, Portugal, but what I found striking was Greece, um, a lady from the refineries industry, right, not coal, but refineries, and basically it is very logical if you think of, we have uh, electric mobility coming up, so cars will not be fueled by gasoline that much anymore, so what is the future business model of, of refineries? And it sounds very familiar to us who've been working in coal regions that obviously refineries, there's a lot of good jobs, there's a lot of important economic factor for a region, but 
but they need to change their business model. And I find that was my personal highlight over the week to hear that uh, in Greece, the refineries are very actively looking into new business models and saying, okay, the whole uh, energy intensive industry needs to decarbonize. Um, they need to have hydrogen. Uh, this is a future business model to provide green hydrogen. And I think it's, it's this kind of, what do we do with the money that is there in terms of just transition fund uh, recovery measures? And how can we really use this as an opportunity? Um, of course, that's easy said, and we know it's all difficult in the region, and the regions have very different opportunities to grapple that. But I think it's, it's, there are bits and pieces of very much creative, forward-looking thinking. Uh, and yeah, we just try to make those opportunities. And Maria, I think you used the term in your presentation, uh, seize the opportunities that are there. Um, I keep it short. Um, I'm looking forward to questions and the discussion. Timon, thank you for your insights and also your brevity. Um, I, I, did, I was quite struck by Timmerman's comment as well about we just can't re rebuild the past, the past economic model, because we'll have to then deconstruct that model and put in place a new decarbonized economic system. And we really should see this opportunity to actually have the green recovery. So I thought that was a very powerful comment through the course of the week. I'm wondering if Yuri has been able to join us. So I will give Yuri um, the opportunity to come in if he is there. Okay, I, I think we can work on the assumption that unfortunately Yuri's connection uh, has unfortunately um, failed. Uh, so I think it's very important that we do move on to the question and answer session because we ha we do have three excellent panelists. Um, I will I will ask Yuri if he could please use a headset as that could be the issue with the connection. But anyway, we will turn to the the, the Q and A. Uh, the first question uh, by Mike Brennan. It's very much about the spatial focusing of the just transition mechanism and the process of transition. And his question is, the Committee of Regions uh, just published its opinion on the just transition mechanism, calling for the mechanism to be implemented at a nuts two level so that the negative spillover effects in the wider region are addressed. Does the panel think this is viable? And this is a very interesting question as it cuts to the very question of where should we focus our resources? Should we focus our resources within the very specific affected communities, or should we be focusing at a wider regional level in regard to our resources for mitigating the effects of, um, of, of decarbonization? And for this question, I'd first like to re ask Kieran to respond to this question. As Kieran, you were talking about a, a one Midlands regional approach and the, re and the need to recognize the impact of uh, decarbonization across a number of counties in Ireland. Uh, please, Kieran, your thoughts on the question. The Just Transition Fund uh, was designated for the Midland region as represented by the Midland region's transition team, and there were four central counties where both the national state peace extraction agency called Bordnamona and our national state uh, uh, power generator, the Electricity Supply Board, were concentrated. They have a long history of over 70 years of involvement in the region. However, uh, as you know, the bogs are not confined to counties. They spread across the landscape, uh, as do the servicing arrangements for those bogs. Uh, so I felt it was necessary to expand peripherally so the region involved to include areas of uh, additional and adjoining counties where our National Peak Company and our National uh, Electricity Generating Company were located and had operations. Now, that has been agreed and supported. It doesn't mean a diffusion of the central effort around the Midlands 
but it does mean that the communities that will be affected by the decisions not to harvest peat in the future from this June of this year uh, can be embraced in the projects, the funding, the application of any strategy investment would be on the map, so to speak, for projects, for green energy investment, for location, for state agency cooperation, and local authority integration and cooperation. So in my mind, uh, it's around not just um, the specific industries and their locations, but the wider effect they can have upon a region that may have a peripheral rather than a central effect. I'm sure this is happening in other regions involving coal and oil shale production and refineries. But uh, I think it will morph very quickly in Ireland into a whole national just transition with the concept developing of a, a just transition commissioner's office on a statutory legal base in Ireland. But I'm concentrating largely on the Midlands as that is the immediate region that is going to be majorly affected by the decisions that are being taken this year. Um, it doesn't mean that other regions in Ireland, particularly in particular locations where there's fossil fuel use for electricity generation, will be in the process of closing down over the next number of years as we meet, move to meet our climate emission targets, etc. Thank you, Kieran, for that uh, very full answer putting the question very much in the Irish context. Maria, I was wondering if you had any views. The, the question is about, you know, where do we focus our resources? And the question was very much asking about the nuts two level. But I'm very conscious of the Asturias situation. You have uh, the, the, the coal communities dispersed across a wide number of municipalities, both in the central area, but also the southwest. Uh, have you any uh, thoughts on this question, Maria? Over to you. Yes, of course. Uh, well, Asturias, uh, it's, it's true, we have different communities, different territories, and some are far away from the others inside the same NAT3. From our perspe perspective, the Just Transition Fund should focus specifically on all the territories which are suffering this transition. And that means not a policy of uh, sharing everything with everybody, but of concentrating the resources on those who really need them, because this transition is going to, to strike and to be uh, to beat very hard some specific territories and regions and uh, not and provinces. And this is very important to focus and concentrate all the resources on those. We haven't chosen this transition, and that is very important to be pointed out. This is not an evolution; it is a revolution. It is a disruption in a model. And we have to look for new models. And this is going to imply a great economic effort, a change of model business. I, I fully agree with Timon on that. We have to change our point of view. We have to uh, look for very new resources and with very expensive initiatives. So we have to concentrate those initiatives where the problem is currently happening. And in all these uh, NAT3, where the regions and, and territories are suffering. Specifically, if we open this too much, uh, this will be a policy of, uh, how could I say that, of sharing everything, of uh, one size fits all, and this is not convenient for the coal regions. Actually, I think that the coal regions are the ones who are suffering more, specifically those that in the indicators are already pointed out as, as these coal regions with coal produ production and extraction, with coal generation, and with a very uh, heavy industrial uh, component and all these regions are going to suffer a transition in three different uh, legs, in three different aspects. So, so they should be uh, supported in a very specific way, too. Thank you, Maria. Um, Timon, have you any views on, on this question and just in regard to where the effort should be focused geographically? Yeah, I, I think that is, it depends very much on, on the region and I, I fully agree that it should not focus just on the very narrow communities where, where there is a coal mine that closes down because there are a lot of spillover effects. Uh, on the other hand, I think it depends on which not two region you look at in, in Europe. There are regions where the coal mining is fairly uh, confined in a certain area and there are other parts of that region that do not really 
feel a strong impact from closing down of uh, coal mining. That is, for example, the case in uh, in the eastern part of Germany, in, in the state of Brandenburg, where Lusatia is clearly the coal mining region, and support go, should go into that region. But other parts of Brandenburg, close to the capital Berlin, have a totally different economic uh, dimension. But I think it's it's a good approach to 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 look at those spillover effects, and, and but leave some leeway to the regions and and uh, provinces or whatever the, the governance structure is uh, to adjust for the very specific needs in the region, as, as Kieran and, and Maria pointed out from their specific perspectives. Yes, no, Yuri. Uh, hello, Robert. Uh, uh, hello. Um, I, I'm assuming that we cannot hear um, Yuri. We still have some technical problems. And hello, hello, Robert. This is uh, uh, the host of this meeting. We are trying to get a connection with uh, Giri, but unfortunately, there are still some problems. Okay. We have one more, um, another question. Um, and it is a, a very personal okay. question. I will try to say, yeah. Hello, can you can you can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yuri, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you all the time, but I had some difficulties with the connection. I'm uh, terribly sorry for that. I'm using uh, WebEx on a regular basis, but when you need it most, uh, okay. it doesn't it's work. It's great, Yuri. You've joined us. That, that, that's good. And I was wondering if you just would like to perhaps just um, give a, a response to that question, just about how do we focus our resources, the Just Transition Mechanism resources at a geographic level, Obviously, you are, operate at the level of the Carlo Vavari region, but the socioeconomic impact of coal mining closures is very much um, focused on the community of Zokolov. So, any thoughts and just in regard to our geographic focus? Uh, yeah, sure, of, of course. Maybe it's a perfect coincidence because I'm uh, right now sitting in the town hall of uh, Khodov. It's a small town you visited during your visit. It's a small town of uh, 15,000 people. Many people from this town, they work uh, at the coal mines, they work at the power plants. Uh, also, the, the city is completely uh, supplied by the central heating system from those power plants. So this town will be the most, one of the most affected places during the transition. So I believe that uh, we should participate as a whole region, because we are, of course, a small region. But uh, some of the, the, the main part of the resources should be focused uh, here in the smaller areas like uh, town of Khodov or, for example, the micro region of Sokolov, because we are talking about uh, like the people here that will lose the jobs, the real people here in the region, and they will be affected the most. So the support should be focused and uh, directed to them. Thank you, Yuri, uh, for that uh, response. It's lovely for you to be joining the call. Um, we actually have a, another uh, question that I think is, is a very pertinent one and very much reflects the discussions we've been having this week on social dialogue and partnership working. And the question is, um, could the panelists spend a few, say a few words on the sensitive issue of how to strike a balance between the very often opposing standpoints of the trade unions and industry and civil society and the environmentalists? So we heard a lot about how we had to collaborate over the last week, but there are tensions in collaboration between these various stakeholder groups. There are vested interests. And I would actually like to address this question in the first uh, instance to, to Kieran, given your background in employment relations in Ireland. Just how do you develop a collaborative model between environmentalists, trade unions, industry, and civil society? Kieran, please, your thoughts. Um, thank you, Robert, for that, because one of the terms of reference for me <laughs> excluded industrial relations, but uh, 
Notwithstanding that, I do address in my report the particular predicament uh, for the workers in the context of the movement away from, from peat harvesting for power generation affecting both primarily the, PA, the board of Mona workers uh, in peat harvesting and secondary the power workers in, in the ESB. Uh, you're talking about effect on, on, on 2,000 plus immediate jobs and then the downstream suppliers in the private sector who would account for another number of thousand jobs. So you're talking about a considerable numbers in the context of Ireland and in the context of the location in Ireland, in, in the Midlands. Uh, the big developments in Ireland industrially from the point of view of technology and foreign direct investment are in the West cities in Galway, South in Cork and Dublin. They're there where our big FDI uh, foreign direct investments take place. So the Midlands is very heavily dependent on this particular industry. Uh, so my concern largely, and it has been expressed to me very trenchantly by the trade unions and by the Congress trade unions, that the priority consideration must be the re-employment in Bordnamona enterprises of uh, the workers, uh, voluntary redundancy, potential pensions where people have reached pension age and wish to avail of that possibility, and the redeployment of redundant workers in new industries in the region that they would have first call on employment. Now, we have, we have a very strong and had had a very strong social partnership system in Ireland between trade unions, government, uh, and employers. And even though we don't have centralized pay agreements like we did in the past, we certainly have a high level of cooperation at the National Economic and Social Council. So I, I come from that tradition. So my concern, and I wrote quite uh, extensively on the shock to workers, their families, and to their immediate communities, their small communities. So there's a, a high degree of integration between employment uh, identification with employment and with the community itself. So they have to be given priority. And I do support Maria and what Maria said. Those immediate affected have to be priority listed for, for consideration. And I do that in my report. Uh, they'll also be given priority consideration if they have ideas for new projects for employment or industry or services in the Just Transition Fund that we've just launched. It is a tension, you're right, Robert. There is a tension sometimes between the interests of those immediately affected as workers and their livelihoods, uh, and sometimes the wider business or the wider community. But I don't detect that in the Midlands in Ireland. As I said, there's a very, very strong uh, family, there's a very strong traditional, there's a very strong county identification. The Midlands don't see themselves as competing counties within the region. And certainly they have responded very positively to my suggestion of consortia being built across regions between private sector, local authorities and state agencies to generate and retain existing employment, generate new employment, generate new ideas. So I, I don't see a division occurring. There will be tensions and there'll be the normal tensions that exist when you close. I've been through a lot of factory closures in the past through previous recessions and sometimes communities disintegrate or positions are taken that are directly opposed. But I don't detect that in the Midlands. In fact, I detect a different wanting to work together, wanting to cooperate together, not to get lost, as somebody has said earlier, about a wider national agenda. They feel they're being hit immediately now. It's obvious the decisions are there. They're immediate. And they want our government and the European Union, and both are responding to that, to come with programs, to come with assistance. They're not looking for handouts. They're not no, looking they're for not. welfare. They're looking for employment, sustainable employment. They want a future. They want a future for themselves, their families. They want to stay in the Midlands. They don't want to, to contribute to the commute to our cities that use up fossil fuels. They know the carbon uh, agenda. Yes. They have reluctantly but necessarily bought into it. They realize it. They're not opposing it. They just want it to be treated fairly, honestly, transparently. And they want a priority from us and the European Union. If they are the first casualties of Europe, 
and European directors and European policy decisions in the area of climate change, they don't want to be the permanent sufferers. Thank you for that, Kieran. A, a very comprehensive answer. No, and I really liked your point. You know that there's a difference between tensions and division. Tension is inevitable in a process of change. Division can actually not necessarily be an inevitability. Maria, I'd quite like to uh, bring you in on this because we've also had a similar question. Just asking, you know, how did you, in a story, how did you bring the miners on board in the process of change? So perhaps we can make this question slightly more specific to Asturias about social dialogue. And can you explain just slightly more fully uh, how you brought the, the mining communities with you? Yes. Um, well, as you said, Robert, it was based mainly on social dialogue because we thought it was the, the necessary step to include uh, all these uh, all these uh, stakeholders so involved in the transition in Asturias, and also because the knowledge of the of each of the stakeholders is a very important part of this process. We need them all together. We need to put the people in the center of all decisions, and this means to imply all the people involved. So what we did, we, we created a committee uh, to evaluate the impact of the of the transition in Asturias and to identify opportunities for the region. And this committee was uh, under the umbrella of the National Ministry of uh, Just Transition, of, of uh, Ecological Transition, and it was led by the by the minister, by the regional minister and Luque Fernandez. And we included in this committee uh, not only the unions they were present in this dialogue. The uh, Association of Entrepreneurs. We included the local, um, the local councils too, the university and the main research center in the region, and different uh, transversal directors of the government, so that there was an open forum of dialogue, formed at the same time by five different groups, sectorial groups on different, for example, in, on different aspects of this transition. Let's say industry, environmental issues, specifically energy issues. And with this dialogue, uh, we have uh, reached a very, I would say, a very rich document uh, brought together by all the parts. The unions were a very important part in this document. They made their own comments, their own reviews. Uh, they, we open a very, I would say, clear, transparent, and, and uh, based on, coffee, on confidence, a way of dialogue with them. And uh, we, we cooperate with, the, with them in this. And we have noticed that although at the beginning, I must say, we somehow feared, uh, feared this, this uh, initiative, uh, we are very happy with the result because the involvement of all the parties has been very important. Also, the national government has launched their own, their own channels of communication through a public participation process in the specific councils where the transition is going to be harder. So it's also very important, this role of the national uh, ministry for this dialogue, social dialogue, and, and involvement of the parties. Thank you, Maria, for, for, for further contextualizing the experience of Asturias in Spain in regard to transition. I, I would like to bring in Yuri uh, just for his thoughts in regard to social dialogue within the Czech Republic and specifically in regard to the case of Carlo Vavari. But I was just reflecting, um, you're, in a, you're in a veto, Maria, and uh, Yiri has actually studied at the University of Avedo mining. And I just think the coal community is such a small community across Europe that we really should be strong in our networking. So Yiri, over to you, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is true that uh, the world is really small. I'm looking forward to visit Asturias next, uh, next time uh, when, I'm, when I have a chance. Uh, about uh, the situation uh, and, uh, and employment, uh, like I said uh, in my first uh, answer to the question, uh, uh, the, the work should be focused uh, here on the city of Hodov, uh, where the people are. We are trying to uh, communicate with those people. Uh, we are trying to uh, offer them solutions. Uh, it's not always easy. There are people that have been working in the mines for a very long time. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to find uh, the proper solution, uh, how to uh, find them in jobs and uh, uh, etc. So uh, the, the situation is really uh, complicated and uh, we are trying to, uh, we are actually a little bit, uh, we were a little bit surprised how the transition is happening fast. So. We are trying to put together some plans and some uh, 
ideas how to how to uh, uh, deal with this transition as best we can. Thank you, Yeri. Timon, I'm conscious that when you were developing the toolkits for governance and for strategy development, you, you obviously looked at that whole question of social dialogue, involvement of the private sector, trade unions. So have you any thoughts or reflections you'd like to share this morning just about how we do achieve that balance of interests between what could be effectively competing groups? Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's important to acknowledge that there are um, yeah actors with different interests, and and um, some of them are quite controversial, uh, and and we need to find ways to bring that together. Um, I think it's it's important to not uh, I don't know to to say that this is too homogeneous, right? It's not all the unions are speaking with one voice. There are uh, unions who are very much focused on very specifically their um, the people they represent, the workers, the miners, specific minor, minor unions, um, other unions that have a much broader view on what are jobs in general and, and how does the transition balance out. And of course, this is not to say that it's easy for an individual person uh, who loses his or her job. Of course, we need to make uh, some sort of, um, I don't know, easy, easing uh, the, the difficulties there. But I think it helps, of course, if, if unions take a bigger picture and see also uh, both the risks and the potentials in the transition. And the same thing uh, holds true for, for the civil society and environmental NGO uh, movement, where some of the um, so parts of civil society or environmentalists very, very strongly focus on environmental questions, while others have, have massively opened up to discuss social economic and specifically social and environmental questions in one thing. And I think it's it's a learning call. And since I come historically more from the environmental part, I would I would also call for, for um, environmental activists to strongly engage in, in social questions and really collectively uh, try to seek questions. And and the the communication uh, and corporation examples from uh, Ireland and Missouri, I think, are good examples, and I think we should try to follow that pathways. And I think part of it is the political discussion on, on a high political level, where big claims need to be made. But part of it is maybe some more quiet discussions in regions where people sit together uh, and really say, okay, what do we do for the region? What is in it for us, and how can we join forces and bring this together? And there are good examples for how this has been done and can be done. Thank you, Timon. Um, I, I think there's a real need to find new tools and, and develop new narratives of collaboration. Um, and that is part of that agenda of being forward looking rather than backward looking. On that, on that question of, of looking to the future, we've, we've got a number of questions around how do we respond? How do we respond to transition in this time of crisis? And it is about finding that balance between doing what works in the past, but looking to new innovation and bold experimentation. So one of the, qu the questions was, you know, finding the balance. Where, what should we do? Should we try and stick with the tried and tested, or should we actually go forward with bold experimentation? And how do we as policymakers or researchers or industrialists find that balance between Sticking with the tried and tested, doing what we know works, but also recognizing the scale of the challenge that we have to be bold and innovative in our policy making and in our project design. So actually, I, I think I'll firstly uh, address this question to Maria, given that you, know, you have an ex a, a, a track record of, of innovation, but how do you find that balance between doing what's worked, but also being uh, focused on experimentation? Maria, please. Well, this is a very interesting question, and it's probably just in the middle of the transition itself, you know. I think the balance is the main part of this transition, because when we talk of just transition, it also means that people don't uh, have to leave their own house, their own territories, so it has to be achieved in place. And uh, what we have is this important experience of the past, uh, and this has given uh, place to a very wide um, ecosystem in the in the region, let's say based on this energy production and this coal experience, which is not only the extraction of coal itself, 
but it also implies research and knowledge. It also implies uh, manufacturing of components and parts. And I think that we have to take all that uh, ecosystem that we have created around coal itself and industry and turn that into the future. And uh, we have to lead that change. We have to be responsible for leading the change. Uh, we cannot adopt the, the, the policy of heading the sand. You know, in, in Spain we say we cannot be like an ostrich. We cannot hide the head in the sand. So we have to, to lead the process, identifying which opportunities coming from that experience are more, uh, let's say, um, more possible for the future and leave us more confident about a potential success. But somehow we have to take some risks too, because this is a new model. So um, we have to look for that balance. And I think that to find the right balance would be exactly the key of success. If we are able to find a balance between the past and the future, we will find that, that uh, possibility. So we have to be very careful too, because if we take um, decisions based only on, on what we think without being, receiving data, uh, we are going to make mistakes too, and this could be a not way back decision. And especially we have to prevent the current employment from being destroyed. It's not only a, a question of attracting new employment, it's also a question of that, of course, but also of maintaining what we have. And what we have now is some other employments in risk that we have to maintain and to use all that uh, ecosystem we have created for the future and find models of success in other regions. And as you said, we are very linked. We have many uh, connections between all these core regions, between Carlo Vivari, Ruggieri, uh, with Liverpool, which went uh, I, under a, a very strong transformation of mining industry too. And we have to work all together to find these opportunities. Thank you, Maria. Um, and the good thing is, I, I totally, agree it's about finding that balance between what has worked and experimentation but the good thing is with the green recovery monies and the just transition mechanism there are opportunities for significant resources for experimentation and innovation Shimon, I'd, I'd like to bring you in on this one but somebody's also asked a specific question that is similar to this uh, but i've asked a specific question to you just about you you, re you reference new business models in your um, in your introduction, uh, could, would you like to say what these models may look like? The, the the question was very much around the nature of ownership in the future uh, of of the means of energy production, etc. But I just wonder if you've got any thoughts about that balance between change and just, uh, and staying with what has worked, but also just uh, perhaps further develop your thoughts on new models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, if you ask me in terms of change and what has worked, um, I don't know, I have two hearts. Uh, one is uh, I'm, I'm a researcher, so I look for the, the, no, the new, right? The unproven, the new thing. I'm very much inclined to let's try something new. On the other hand, I'm a researcher. I try to put my decisions and recommendations on very solid facts. I would not say the new has to be, oh, let's just experiment something and try something crazy. Um, it can be a mix of both. Um, in terms of the question of new business models and, and, and especially ownership financing, I think that is part of it. I, can, I cannot just give it a very simple answer on this, but I yeah. think it's, it's part of, of our thinking. It is not just substituting technology A with technology B in many cases. Um, and if, if, if I look beyond coal, um, I don't know, into transport, when we talk about how would future mobility look like um, in terms of more, can there be more car sharing? How do electric cars fit into a system? Is that really privately owned cars or will there be self-driven cars that can be used by different people in cities, hop on, hop off things? If, as soon as you enlarge your thinking towards, it's not only substituting technology A with B, but how does that look into a, a totally different business model? Then I think that helps us gaining more creative solutions. And I mean, as, as, as dramatic and as negative many of, of the COVID impacts have been, I think if, if, if I take a step back, one thing I've experienced over the last three, three months is, oh, there are things possible 
we would have not dreamed of being possible four months ago. I'm not saying this is a good thing, and I, 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 I enjoyed this experience, not at all. It's, it's, it's a very difficult thing. But in terms of state interaction, collaboration, new ways of dealing with difficulties, uh, people have put so much creativity and political power into solving a, a, a problem. And if we put this into solving the issues in coal regions, well, we could get dramatic steps ahead in, in very quick time. Thank you, Timon. I, I'm conscious of our time, and uh, we are actually, this has been a very rich discussion, excellent questions. But um, I think we will have to wrap up very soon. But I do, I do want to get the, the views of Kieran and Yeri on this one. Kieran, you, you've been involved in public life in Ireland for a number of years, I think it's fair to say, and you've mm -hmm. often had to face those questions of how do you find the balance between doing what is tried and tested but also being bold enough to experiment and, and innovate. Have you any reflections on, on, on this challenge within the context of decarbonization? Well, my view, Robert, <coughs> excuse me, my view largely around this and the view I took when I was reporting to government was that uh, the inevitability of uh, the decisions around peat harvesting uh, crisis brings its challenges, it brings its opportunities, it brings its difficulties. But I, I prefer to look from the positive point of view. Um, I wouldn't be risk adverse. Uh, I couldn't have done my job in the past if I had been. You take risks. They work. Some of them won't work. Uh, but we can learn from those who don't work. And great if the other risk you take in terms of funding, supporting, uh, promoting, providing seed capital to new enterprises, micro enterprises, or foreign direct investment. So, in a sense, uh, in terms of the peatlands in Ireland, I, I think the peatlands are such an an extraordinary natural resource in Ireland that we can develop and are developing new industries from them in the biodiversity field, in agriculture, in organic farming, uh, also in the context of uh, aquaculture, um, hydrophonics, all of those that are based on the bogs and can be based on the peatlands and the utilization of those. Taking the wider view and what COVID has taught us, but even before COVID, the importance of uh, creating innovation centers, working with the universities, third level institutions, schools, to ensure the population has an opportunity to stay, work, study in the region and bring up families and lives there. So I think we are learning now that broadband technology is such a vital component of uh, doing, providing public services, private sector services, enterprises, et cetera. I think we're going to go to a new period of uh, expanding technology in manufacturing and in service to look at this. There's undoubtedly the issue is going to arise of, of trying to ensure that uh, that's balanced between those who wish to work remotely or from home, the health and safety implications of that, and the necessity to maintain production, manufacturing, light engineering, construction, et cetera. Retrofitting, we're committing now to a half a million retrofits with the pilot schemes taking place. The whole area, and I think Yuri or Timon referred to it, the whole new technology and construction around retrofitting uh, solar energy, solar panels, insulation is an absolutely new technology that is developing rapidly. The other issue is renewable energies uh, around the, uh, the fact that we can develop new renewable energies uh, and our commitment to that. The other issue I find important is the necessity to skill, upskill, retrain uh, current workforces that exist within the industries or the service industries to those that are closing down now. That is vitally important in the training because they have skills, uh, they have excellent craft skills, they have excellent technology skills. These should not be lost, but they need to be upgraded and adapted to new requirements. And that does not require a great level of, of, of investment. It requires investment, but not enormous investment to achieve and do that. So I, I like to look on the situation 
as the glass being three quarters full rather than a quarter empty. And that this challenge that we have now in our regions, uh, it's immediate, it's now, it's not going to be changed, it's not going to be deferred. It is a reality and we need to meet a reality. We need to meet the burning platform that exists and we need to be innovative try things we never tried before if they succeed wonderful if they don't let's learn from the mistakes and try again but i think we have a tremendous opportunity i think the support that's there from central government in our countries but also the great and major uh, investment now being made by the european union uh, in the regions is a vote of confidence in the future it's the great next big move by the european union uh, economically and politically And we have to face up to that challenge, make it work, make sure the funds are applied and that the people in the regions are the beneficiaries of them. Thank you, Kieran, uh, for that, you know, insightful, but also uplifting comments about the future. And I I love, you know, the glass being 75 percent full. Um, I think it's closer to 78 percent myself. (laughs) But anyway, Yeri, um, unfortunately, we've been beaten by the clock, but I would like to bring you in. Have you got um, any comments uh, you would like to make on this question, very much within the context of Carlo Vavari? Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm a lot of time as well. I just uh, basically agree with what uh, Karen said. Uh, there is a big challenge ahead of us. And when it comes to the plans for the future, I believe that uh, we should stay uh, realistic. We uh, plan what is real and can be really achieved within the regions. But also, on the other hand, I see opportunity uh, to experience a little bit with the new technologies because the things are evolving so fast. And uh, if there is opportunity to experience a little bit, it will be uh, the time. But like I said, the first the first thought is to stay realistic and uh, to make sure that there is no disturbance in the in the regions and uh, make sure that everything is uh, in place and the transition is smooth. And if we can uh, experience a little bit in the meantime, that would be only added value of this transition. That is just uh, for the the question. Thank you, Yuri. Um, I I will leave it there. I think this has been an incredibly rich discussion. And I think it's demonstrated one thing, that we can move to being systems thinkers. I've been really encouraged by the discussion this morning by the panelists, recognizing the connections between the economic, the environmental, the social. I do leave on one point um, that Maria said. We need to be leaders of change. And I think that applies to us all. All of us need to be leaders of change, whether you're in the public sector, the private sector, civil society. We all have to be leaders of change. We cannot be victims of change. We have to be agents of change. And we have to become those leaders of change and agents of change very quickly. But a very inspiring and insightful uh, panel discussion. So, So thank you so much. I'm now going to hand over to Carlo, who's going to begin to look to the future. What, how will the, the platform, or rather the Co-Regions and Transition Initiative, evolve in the coming months? So, Carlo, please, over to you. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Robert. And, uh, and thank you very much to, to the panelists. Uh, thanks, Maria, Kiran, Yidi, uh, and of course, uh, Timon, uh, for the very interesting discussion. Um, at the end of the day, uh, one of the objectives of the, of the, of the core regions in, uh, in transition initiative is to share experiences. Uh, and it's even more important in, in times like these. Uh, so we're, I'm happy that we could have the opportunity to have this exchange. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed it too, although it's a virtual space for the moment, but, uh, but who knows? <laughs> uh, soon we, we, we might have the opportunity to, to go back to the, to the physical, um, to, to a physical space. Um, as a secretariat, we're always very happy to, to, to work as, as, a, as a contact point to collect um, the experiences that, that, uh, that come from the regions in transition, uh, but also to the, uh, to the wider uh, civil society. Um, we welcome, therefore, any, any information you'd like to share with us, and um, we will try to find a way, we will find a way uh, to, uh, to communicate these uh, uh, to the members of the of the initiatives uh, and to the wider the wider community. Um, uh, let me also take uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, those that have found the time to, to reply to, to the survey that we have uh, uh, that Robert and, and, and Paul were, were, were mentioning before. 
um, in, in this in this very busy times. So 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 thank you a lot for this. Uh, we would like to carry out similar activities again in, in the future. Um, hopefully, hopefully you agree. Otherwise, let us know. Um, and we would like to hear your thoughts um, uh, about the future uh, of the initiative, um, not only through survey, but uh, or, or or an exchange email, but also starting uh, starting from now. Um, so I think we have. Uh, uh, there you go. We will have. Uh, um, uh, some question for you. We would like you to to answer. Uh, Live, uh, there's a, in the in the in the in the right panel of your screen. The 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 the, the, the poll will will come out in in a few seconds, um, and they're linked to to that will be very helpful for 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 the future of our work. So uh, they, they mainly focus on on the three topics, which is basically on the format um, of the uh, of these working group meetings. Uh, we're now um, we only had physical meetings at the beginning. Now we have uh, we had the first virtual week. Uh, intense virtual week and uh, but also very interesting um, and uh, so did you like it <laughs> it is something that we should consider for the future uh, and then uh, another question is about uh, the way we communicate with you the, the way that in which uh, these experiences are shared for instance um, and uh, should it be through to webinars to through to the website of the european commission and so on um, and then the last question is about uh, is about the teams that you would like to 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 be covered in the in the next working group meeting, whatever the form uh, whatever form it will take. Um, so I think now the we can uh, we can open the um, the poll. Um, hello, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So uh, you can you can start uh, um, uh, voting now. Uh, there's uh, um, uh, you can you can see a few a few a couple of questions here on the screen. But if you if you scroll down, uh, then you will see also uh, also the third one. Uh, so the first question is, uh, as I was saying before, is really about uh, about the format. Shall we? Uh, only try to have physical meetings, or uh, shall we only have virtual meetings? Or maybe you enjoy this week very, very much, and uh, or, or or shall we shall we try to, to have a mix uh, of this uh, um, uh, of this format? Uh, the second question, and uh, uh, apparently you're allowed to provide two two answers or two two choices, and uh, is about uh, the um, what are the communication tools that you find most useful for you? Uh, some of them have been uh, implemented during this time of uh, uh, of, um, uh, uh, of virtual meetings, such as the the webinars that were linked to the toolkits. Uh, some of them are uh, still not developed, but would be, this is why it would be nice to to have your views, such as the, the podcasts, um, and um, and then you have the more usual usual communication tools that we do uh, that we that we have. That we have worked with in, in in the past year and a, and a half of the secretariat, but uh, um, we really uh, I think that um, these times also give the opportunity to really understand what is what are the, the most useful communication uh, tools that we can put in place. Uh, the third question is um, uh, is more um, linked to the team. So what what do you think should be the focus of, of the next uh, of the next of the next working group meeting, uh, regardless the format that it will take. Um, Please consider this. This will not be the only opportunity you have, of course, to express your uh, the, um, your ideas on what should be the themes to be covered. Um, you will receive a, a satisfaction survey after this week, where you could also have this opportunity. Uh, and in any case, um, uh, you know you know how to reach us, uh, or at least I hope so. Uh, and uh, we will we will of course take into in, into consideration any uh, uh, any suggestions um, and. Um, and let's see now. Uh, I think we are. Um, we will have our first idea on this. But again, this is not your last. Uh, your last opportunity to express your uh, your ideas. So the time is over. Um, can we perhaps uh, have a look uh, at the results? Um, they should. They should come up. Uh, I think. Or, or no one has voted. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, there you go. There you go. Okay. So uh, in terms of format, uh, so apparently this this virtual week uh, was uh, uh, turned out to be um, turned out to be quite successful, as uh, as um, um, the majority uh, 
of, uh, of participant voting for a mix of physical and, uh, and virtual events. And uh, um, we, will, uh, uh, we will, of course, uh, try to, 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 to make it happen. Uh, when it comes to communication tools, okay, this is a, um, we see a, a very strong uh, um, uh, successful rate for the webinars, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is very interesting for us. Uh, I hope this is linked also to the uh, interest that was uh, um, uh, linked to the, to the webinars that we did for the toolkits. Uh, but of course, it's, it's a form of communication that we can uh, and we will uh, take into consideration for the future uh, sharing of, uh, of experiences and work uh, of the Secretariat. Um, as concerned the teams, there are more of a variety as, a, as, as perhaps we could uh, uh, we could already foresee um, uh, that comes, uh, of course, uh, from funding uh, uh, through, through policy development uh, and implementation. Um, so pretty much I see there's, there's quite, a, quite, quite a range of, uh, of topics that, uh, that uh, we will try to address in the, in the upcoming, in the upcoming uh, um, working group meetings and then the overall activities um, uh, of the Secretariat that the secretary is doing in supporting the, 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 the work of the coal regions in transition uh, initiative. Okay, um, I think we can go back now to the, to the slide. Um, we will also share this result with you in, the, in, the, in further communication in the, in, in the coming uh, uh, days or weeks. Um, so thank you very much uh, uh, for your feedback and uh, as I said, we will be in touch again with, with you. You have the opportunity to, to express your interest for, for the coming uh, topics or, or format. Um, as I lighted today, uh, also, and thanks to our panelists uh, and again to, to the round table, um, uh, co-regions uh, do, do leave at certain times, uh, but we can uh, nevertheless recognize, uh, as Robert uh, uh, also mentioned just, just before, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's an increasing clarity uh, on the policy and funding schemes, uh, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as a clear commitment from the European Commission uh, to support the transition journey um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the regions. Um, this intensive week, uh, um, I hope many of you had the opportunity to, to follow from the beginning, uh, started with the, with the launch of the Just Transition platform uh, that uh, helped also shedding some light on the role of the just transition mechanism in, uh, in all its, its, its three pillars, um, including uh, the definition of the, of the territorial transition plans and the role that they will have in, in the whole mechanism. Um, but we've also learned that transition can not only be linked to just transition fund. Uh, there's, a, there's many opportunities out there that, uh, that will need to be, to be exploited from the modernization fund, innovation fund, uh, other, co other uh, cohesion policy tools, uh, as well as, for instance, life projects and the role of the EBRD and the, and the, and the EID. Um, uh, it has been also, also mentioned today again, but uh, um, uh, it's good to, 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 uh, to bring it back again that uh, overall, as, as Vice President Timmerman said, uh, during the first day of this event, uh, we cannot really miss the opportunity to merge in recovery um, uh, with a green transition. Um, and we recognize regions uh, are, in a journey to, are in a journey to respond to challenges uh, and, and the opportunities uh, as well uh, of transitions. Uh, we are ourselves uh, as, as a secretariat in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a journey to, um, in, in an evolution to respond to the needs uh, uh, of the regions that, that are part uh, uh, of, this, of these initiatives. Uh, for example, the need to extend the social dialogue, as also was just mentioned uh, in, the, in, the, in the round table, um, and engaging with the public and private sector um, and the civil society uh, will play even a greater role uh, in our next, uh, next meetings, whatever form uh, they will take. And we will, of course, also continue to adapt our services uh, uh, to these times. Uh, we just saw in the, in the, in the little uh, voting system that uh, the webinars are um, it, it's some, something that we will need to, uh, to, to address more, but also um, uh, the way that we, that we present and the way that we implement these virtual meetings, uh, the use of surveys, uh, uh, and overall making the most of the available tools that we have um, until we can, uh, of course, uh, integrate these with, with physical meetings and, uh, and with the, uh, also with the um, with physical journeys also, also to our technical assistance uh, uh, activities. 
Uh, in difficult times, communities uh, come together, and the Coal Regions in Position Initiative uh, is one of the places where this, uh, where this can happen. Uh, as a secretariat, we are, we are here for you, of course, and, and we'll do what we can to, to support, uh, to support this, this initiative. Um, to close this, uh, the, 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 this day and uh, the whole week, I would like to thank uh, all contributors from across the, the European Commission, uh, all the speakers, uh, but especially you, uh, the participants, for taking the time uh, to take part in the numerous sessions of this week. Uh, the, the, during the week, uh, we had uh, an average of 250 participants per, per session, uh, which is very good, uh, with a peak of uh, uh, 475, I believe, participants. Um, and uh, uh, we had the, the opportunity to listen to, to around 40 speakers uh, throughout the whole week. Um, I also would like to, to take the opportunity to thank the colleagues uh, at DG Energy um, and also from the other uh, DGs of the European Commission, uh, but especially Mr. Mr. Borchat uh, for his support during uh, this first year and a half of the Secretariat uh, and to the broader Core Regions in Position Initiative. Uh, we got to learn this week that he will start a new chapter of his life and we of course would like to wish him uh, all the best uh, for, the, for the future. Uh, Finally, um, a special big thank to, to our uh, events, uh, or better virtual events team uh, in, in this case, uh, but most likely also, also, also in the future. So Roberto, Elisa, Natalia, Leila, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for the great work and, uh, and for, this, uh, for this intense week. Um, so thank you very much again. Uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you, uh, the, the whole secretary also looks forward to seeing you uh, in the next working group meeting, hopefully in October and uh, I wish you all the best. Have a nice weekend.